All right, so now we're going to talk about the major players who were all involved in World War II, in particular the people who were at the heads of government. So this is the various heads of government in, for the Allies and the Axis powers. We've already talked about uh, Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. We haven't really talked about Tojo and, and uh, Emperor Hirohito of Japan because they're not really involved just yet. But we're going to talk about the Allied powers first. So Winston Churchill, he's the head of Great Britain. He's the prime minister. That's how they elect their... Uh, he's basically, he's not really the president because they don't really work on a presidential system. Basically, a prime minister is elected by the British Parliament. So this is how it works. The British citizens go and elect members of the legislative branch called the Parliament. The Parliament then pick out their prime minister who leads policy. And that's how it works. So it's kind of like it starts the citizens and it goes to the elected officials. And the elected officials elect the top super official. Now, he's in office from 1940 to 1945, and he is extremely critical of the policy of appeasement. This whole idea of just give Hitler what he wants and leave us alone. He'd view that as a bunch of malarkey. And he writes in his memoirs later on in his uh, sixth volume set on the history of World War II, just basically saying the entire time that the appeasement's happened, he's saying, this is bad. These are bad things that are happening. We know what Hitler's going to do. We're just, the wolf of Germany's going to take us over. He's He's going to run roughshod over Europe and over Eastern Europe, and it's going to be a terrible, terrible situation. He's saying this all in the 1930s, by the way. By the time he gets in office, the die is already cast. A war is coming. Hitler has a lot more power than he would have, let's say, in 1937 or 36. All right, Joseph Stalin. He is the leader of communist Soviet Union, or co- communist Russia, the United, so- Soviet, uh, United Soviet Republic. So you're talking about the USSR, he is the uh, guy that takes over after uh, Lenin, who was very famous for, during war, our election in World War One, And he essentially starts the beginning of the Cold War, basically right after World War Two ends. So he's a big character in history, and he's a big part of this whole PowerPoint because he actually has influences that, that are very heavy later on in the Cold War. All right, the Non-Aggression Pact. In 1939... It's a pact signed by Stalin and Hitler. So basically it's Stalin saying, I won't invade you. And Hitler saying, well, we won't invade you back. And it basically says we're not going to attack each other. Um, Hitler violated it two years later when he invaded the USSR or Russia. So here's a quick map of all the various powers that exist during this time period and all the ones that are really at play. We have the Axis powers in green. We got the neutral nations. And there's quite, notice there's quite a few neutral nations here. Turkey's neutral at this point. Spain and Ireland are both neutral. You might think it's kind of strange given Ireland's proximity to Great Britain. Sweden's neutral. Switzerland's always neutral. Later on, you're going to hear, you might hear the word protectorate used. A protectorate during this time period basically means we've taken you over, but just not officially. That's essentially what the German idea of being a protectorate was. Areas annexed would be Vienna, Austria, and portions of Czechoslovakia. All these areas, like the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia, that kind of area. Are right, there some cavalry from World War II? All right. And this is Little Red Riding Hood, and she represents Poland. We'll go back on the map in just a second. But basically finding that ger- the German wolf is in, bear- in bed with the Russian bear. They're in bed together, and they're colluding. They're friends now. And if you want to look right here, Poland is right here. So Poland has this, these guys on this side, the USSR, and they got Germany on their Western front. So they're kind of sandwiched between these two sides that are both kind of like, hmm, we like Poland. Poland has stuff. Maybe we should take Poland stuff. All right, this is the last part of the Axis powers. This is Emperor Hirohito. He's the emperor of Japan during World War II. And his son is currently the Emperor of Japan. Now it's still technically an imp- empire, although he's j- the, em- the Emperor is now just a figurehead. Um, to give you an idea of the time period we're talking about and at what level Emperor means at this point, there were still people in Japan who viewed the Emperor as some form of deity. Like That's what we're talking about in 1926. They viewed him as a kind of deity. So he, like when, they, when, he, when Emperor Hirohito went on the radio at one point towards the end of the war, when he basically was surrendering or making the notice public of the end of the war. Like people had never heard his voice before. That's what we're talking about. He always had his other people come out and talk on the radio. So, so it was a big deal. There was a lot of mysticism and mythology associated with Japan and national pride. All right. Now in 1931, he attacked Manchuria, which is a portion of China, very mineral rich. It's, um, 
he and this violated a whole host of international treaties. Like it was just you weren't supposed to do this. There were treaties in place, and he just violated them. By the time 1940 rolls around, they Hirohito controls most of eastern China, and it is a nasty situation. There, um, we're not going to talk. We might not talk about the Rape of Nanking, but if you ever want to want to keep track of things we always every time we think about world war ii and atrocities and terrible things happening we think oh hitler duh obviously and there's certainly just far reason for that he was a terrible person who killed millions of people based on their race terrible the reason why we're able to do that is because the nazis kept meticulous records of everything they kept records of how many they killed they kept records of where they pulled them from they kept meticulous records of everything they were very very record keeping oriented so when push came to show, we found all this information out. It was all kind of in one place. We found the information about what was going on in the death camps for the most part. We found a lot of info. A lot of that same stuff and brutality was happening in Manchuria and China at the hands of the Japanese. They just didn't keep records of it. Horrible things. Uh, things, rape. They call it the Rape of Nanking for a reason because women were raped. One of the most famous scenes, and there is footage of it, where basically there are, these, there are just Japanese soldiers grabbing little Chinese babies, throwing them in the air, and then stabbing on their bayonets to catch them. Like, it's terrifyingly brutal what they did. And there is no real record of it, because except for, like, footage and survivor stories. It was a horrible, horrible time. There were, and people were prosecuted for war crimes in Japan. They're just not as well known. Um, additionally, it's a different kind of cultural aspect, too. If you... Trip, please go downstairs. Daddy's doing something. Go downstairs. On top of that, in Germany, like you don't mention the Holocaust because it's like a national shame. Like, you, like you, they learn about it in school, but it is a solemn, terrible thing that they're ashamed for. In Japan, they don't talk about it at all. It's like it didn't happen. Like, not like they don't even bring it up. They don't. They don't acknowledge it. It's like they go la 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 la, stick their he- ears in their heads, and don't worry about it. At least that's my view of it, based on what I've read. But they are just essentially just they don't. They probably feel terrible about it if you were to bring it up, but they don't acknowledge it. The same way, like in America, we acknowledge civil rights. We acknowledge the fact that there was Jim Crow. We acknowledge slavery as a terrible thing that we, that the United States government sponsored and participated in as a terrible thing. They don't learn about it that way in Japan. It's a very strange system over there. All right, Hideki Tojo, Prime Minister of Japan. This is the guy that basically put the orders in place. The Emperor, this guy, he's not really a figurehead, but he's the head of government. He has a lot of power, but this is the guy who actually did this stuff. This is the guy that's later brought up on war crime tri- for a war crimes trial, which is all this right here. <laughs> this is his war crimes trial later on. All right, the Neutrality Act, a series of measures passed by Congress in the 1930s proclaiming neutrality from foreign conflict. Basically, it reflected the U.S.'s desire to stay the heck out of this. And keep in mind, that makes it sound kind of cowardly. We're coming out of the Great Depression. We were in World War One for a little while. We are just basically trying to get out of things. We don't want to be involved. We are very like, um, we're way the heck over here. We don't know those people. Um, most of our immigration is no longer coming from Europe the same way it used to be. So our connections are slowly fading away from Europe. So there's not the push to go help one side or the other. This act is not is in place until it's repealed by the Lend-Lease. All right, and it's not lending and leasing stuff, by the way. That's the name. It's FDR's program for arming Britain. So basically what he's doing is he's literally lending and leasing arms and material all the way to Great Britain. Now, this breaks the neutrality because, hey, now we're helping out one side, which is Great Britain. We're helping out the Allied side. And we are only helping with arms and I think maybe a few special kind of soldiers, like pilots, people who have specialties. They could go over, but it was very strange. Like, it was... Kept hush hush. They didn't talk about it too much. But the big thing is, we're giving them guns, bullets, and things to blow people up with. That's what we're doing. All right. Total in lease aid: twenty eight billion to to <laughs> to June nineteen forty four. So this is how much stuff's going over there: food, munitions, the big thing, industrial materials, oil, fuel, services. All these various things adding up, just a huge amount of money going to the war effort. Although we're not, we have not declared war. This is where it kind of got spread out to. Most of it ends up going to the UK because that's what, at this point, that's the front. So we're talking about what year is this? 1941. France is on its knees at this point. 
things are really bad. Great Britain's the next step. So Great Britain is the is the front that we they got to deal with. So most of the money's going over there. The USSR is getting a lot because they have the eastern front with Germany that they have to deal with. But their issues are not nearly as bad as Britain's because keep in mind Great Britain is an island. They can only get stuff if it's shipped to them. So that's why they get a whole lot more. All right, the quarantine speech. Now this is 1937, so a few years before Lynn lease. This is FDR's speech condemning all aggressor nations and calling for nations to quarantine or isolate those nations in order to protect democracy. So basically he's saying, Hitler, Mussolini, y'all are being terrible. So what other nations should do is get around you and basically just never let you expand. Like you are stuck and we got to protect ourselves and protect democracy. This kind of harkens back to what Wilson did. Like the reason why we're, we're going out to these places is to make the world safe for democracy. That, as in, democracy is the highest form of government, but it can't exist if there's despots who are destroying who are destroying the will of the people. All right, on to Pearl Harbor. This is probably the most famous day in U.S. history outside of possibly nowadays 9/11 because it was such it's so much more recent. December 7, 1941. <coughs> Excuse me, I had to cough. Japan lost a surprise attack, and by surprise. I mean, they had basically just a few months before said how what good friends we are. They like in, sent friendship medals to us, that kind of stuff. So this was a backstabbing, nasty surprise attack. It was it was at the time in Hawaii in Pearl Harbor, which was not a state yet, so this uh, it was a naval base, and it ju- they just decimated our Pacific fleet because we kept them all in one spot. Since Pearl Harbor, we still use the lessons of Pearl Harbor to this day. That much of the fleet is never going to be one place ever again. They're always going to be shipped around and moving. You're never going to have that many ships in one port because it just made them a sitting duck to do anything. And this is what leads us to entering into World War II. Basically, like, the next day, they declare war. December 8th. This is him going in front of Congress, a joint session, going, just, like, we have to declare war against Japan. And he, he just demands a declaration. It's near unanimous. And, uh, yeah... One day, they went. We went from being buddies, almost allies with Japan, all the way to being at war with them in inside of forty-eight hours. So this is a big deal. And then right after that, uh, Germany declares war against the United States because they're allies, and so on and so forth. This is a uh, memorial for the United States, Arizona. The Arizona is very famous because basically everybody on board died. It was a, one of the first. It was one of the first few ships that got hit by torpedoes, and nobody was ready for it, and it just sank like a rock. And you can still see it today. You can still see the outline of the ship. And they just basically put the thing over top. There was a very, very cool um, documentary that was done about the Arizona a few years ago. Where basically, because they wanted to build the memorial, they actually had to go down there with welding uh, plasma cutters and welders and things like that to grind off pieces of the ship so they could have this little memorial on top of it level. And they took the pieces and chunked them and took them out to the woods of Hawaii, like in the forest. And so, like a forest ranger found it, traced it, did the hist- historical reference on it, and uh, basically found the providence, meaning that the tracing of this metal back to the Arizona, and only he knows where it is. He basically, if he takes anyone out there, they're blindfolded, and every now and then what will happen is he'll find a World War II, like up until recently because they're getting very old at this point, he would, if a, a veteran wanted to go on a tour who was, in, who was basically stationed at Pearl Harbor, he lets them take a piece away with them, that kind of stuff. Very, very sentimental. Very interesting piece of history with, with, Pearl, with uh, Pearl Harbor and the Arizona. It's a... Uh, it's a very cool. I w- I've always wanted to go. It's super cool, but it's all the way in Hawaii, which is really far away. There's another image of the memorial, and you can see the ship. It's the kind of thing where, like, you can look down and like, it's it's not like so many things like from the Revolution to the Civil War. Like, yeah, that looks like a fort. Really, it's just, it just looks like mounds of dirt now. You can't really tell what it was. When you're at the Arizona, you can look down just like this, and you see, oh, people died right there, and they died 70 years ago, right? Or almost 80 years ago now. Like people just sank, drowned, never came back up, and I can see where it happened. So it's a very emotional experience for a lot of people to go there. All right, and to sum it up, you have the enemies, the, the guys we don't like, the Nazis, the Italians, the Japanese. They're the Axis powers, and the Allied powers are the U.S., the U.K., United Kingdom, and then you also or we also call them Great Britain, and then you also have the Russians, the Communist Russians. Got to be clear, they are the USSR, the Communist Russians. And that is it for this lecture, guys. Thanks for watching.